Hello YouTube, this is Largo64 with part 13 of Ingersoll, The Gods. I'm going to begin with the very next paragraph this time, try to get this thing wrapped up. These are the sublime truths that enabled man to throw off the yoke of superstition. These are the splendid facts that snatched the scepter of authority from the hands of priests. In that vast cemetery called the Past, there are most of the religions of men, and there, too, are nearly all their gods. The sacred temples of India were ruins long ago. Over column and cornice, over the painted and pictured walls, cling and creep the trailing vines. Brahma, the golden with four heads and four arms, Vishnu, the somber, the punisher of the wicked, with his three eyes, his crescent and his necklace of skulls, Shiva, the destroyer, red with seas of blood, Kali, the goddess, uh, Drupadi, the white-armed, and Krishna, the Christ, all passed away and left the thrones of heaven desolate. Along the banks of the sacred Nile, Isis, no longer wandering, weeps, searching for the dead Osiris. The shadow of Typhon's scowl falls no more upon the waves. The sun rises as of yore, and his golden beams still smite the lips of Memnon, but Memnon is as voiceless as the Sphinx. The sacred fanes are lost in desert sands. The dusty mummies are still waiting for the resurrection promised by their priests, and the old beliefs wrought in curiously sculptured stone sleep in the mystery of a language lost and dead. Odin, the author of life and soul, Vili and Ve, and the mighty giant Ymir, strode long ago from the icy halls of the north, and Thor, with iron glove and glittering hammer, dashes mountains to the earth no more. Broken are the circles and cromlechs of the ancient druids, fallen upon the summits of the hills, and covered with the centuries' moss are the sacred cairns. The divine fires of Persia and of the Aztecs have died out in the ashes of the past, and there is none to rekindle and none to feed the holy flames. The harp of Orpheus is still. The drained cup of Bacchus has been thrown aside. Venus lies dead in stone, and her white bosom heaves no more with love. The streams still murmur, but no naiads bathe. The trees still wave, but in the forest aisles no dryads dance. The gods have flown from high Olympus. Not even the beautiful women can lure them back. And Danae lies unnoticed, naked to the stars. Hushed forever are the slumbers of Sinai, or Sinai. Lost are the voices of the prophets, and the land once flowing with milk and honey is but a desert waste. One by one the myths have faded from the clouds. One by one the phantom host has disappeared, and one by one... Facts, truth, and realities have taken their places. The supernatural has almost gone, but the natural remains. The gods have fled, but man is here. Nations, like individuals, have their periods of youth, of manhood, and decay. Religions are the same. The same inexorable destiny awaits them all. The gods created by the nations must perish with their creators. They were created by men, and like men, they must pass away. The deities of one age are the bywords of the next. The religion of our day and country is no more exempt from the sneer of the future than the others have been. When India was supreme, Brahma sat upon the world's throne. When the scepter passed to Egypt, Isis and Osiris received the homage of mankind. Greece, with her fierce valor, swept to empire, and Zeus put on the purple of authority. The earth trembled with the thread of Rome's intrepid sons. The tr it says thread, I think it means tread. Um, and Jove grasped with mailed hand the thunderbolts of heaven. Rome fell, and Christians from her territory, with the ro red sword of war, carved out the ruling nations of the world. And now... Christ sits upon the old throne. Who will, his, who will be his successor? Day by day, religious conceptions grow less and less intense. Day by day, the old spirit dies out of a book and creed. 
The burning enthusiasm, the quenchless zeal of the early church have gone, never, never to return. The ceremonies remain, but the ancient faith is fading out of the human heart. The worn-out arguments fail to convince. The denunciations that once blanched the faces of a race excite us in only derision and disgust. As time rolls on, the miracles grow mean and small, and the evidences our fathers thought conclusive utterly fail to satisfy us. There is an irrepressible conflict between religion and science, and they cannot peaceably occupy the same brain nor the same world. While utterly discarding all creeds and denying the truth of all religions, there is neither in my heart nor upon my lips a sneer for the hopeful, loving, and tender souls who believe that from all this discord will result a perfect harmony, that every evil will in some mysterious way become a good, and that above and over, over all there is a being who in some way will reclaim and glorify every one of the children of men, but for those who heartlessly try to prove that salvation is almost impossible, that damnation is almost certain, that the highway of the universe leads to hell, who fill life with fear and death with horror, who curse the cradle and mock the tomb. It is impossible to entertain other feelings than of pity, contempt, and scorn. Reason, observation, and experience, the holy trinity of science, have taught us that happiness is the only good, that the time to be happy is now, and the way to be happy is to make others so. This is enough for us. In this belief we are content to live and die. If by any possibility the existence of a power superior to and independent of nature shall be demonstrated, there will then be time enough to kneel. Until then, let us stand erect." Notwithstanding the fact that infidels in all ages have battled for the rights of man and have at all times been the fearless advocates of liberty and justice, we are constantly charged by the church with tearing down without building again. The church should by this time know that it is utterly impossible to rob men of their opinions. The history of religious persecution fully establishes the fact that the mind necessarily resists and defies every attempt to control it by violence. The mind necessarily clings to old ideas until prepared for the new. The moment we comprehend the truth, all erroneous ideas are of necessity cast aside. A surgeon once called upon a poor cripple and kindly offered to render him any assistance in his power. The surgeon began to discourse very learnedly upon the nature and origin of disease, of the curative properties of certain medicines, of the advantages of exercise, air, and light, and of the various ways in which health and strength could be restored. These remarks were so full of good sense and discovered so much profound thought and accurate knowledge that the cripple, becoming thoroughly alarmed, cried out, "'Do not, I pray you, take away my crutches!' They are my only support, and without them I should be miserable indeed. I am not going, said the surgeon, to take away your crutches. I am going to cure you, and then you will throw your crutches away yourself. For the vagaries of the clouds, the infidels proposed to substitute the realities of earth. For superstition, the splendid demonstrations and achievements of science— and for theological tyranny, the chainless liberty of thought. We do not say that we have discovered all, that our doctrines are all in all of truth. We know of no end to the development of man. We cannot unravel the infinite complications of matter and force. The history of one monad is as unknown as that of the universe. One drop of water is as wonderful as all the seas. One leaf as all the forests, and one grain of sand, as all the stars. I'm going to break it off here and uh, finish up in uh, episode 14, which will be fairly short compared to these. Thanks for watching so far, those of you who are still with me. Where is my button for off? Hold on, here we go. There.